Did you know that historically speaking, the middle class was always the engine of American economic growth and prosperity? This is because they comprise most of the population and are the biggest spending group. That's why now with inflation rate being over 8.2%, they are being specifically targeted and encouraged to spend less and save more in the hope that this will curb inflation. In today's video, we're gonna talk about the proposals made by Congress. Some are specifically made for the middle class earner, which supposedly help with the issues in the inflation rate and how they can benefit those who spend less and save more. Hi, I'm Munif Ali, a self-made multimillionaire who started this channel just to share my life experiences to teach you how to become more successful. If you like this type of content, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. The very core of the issue with inflation is that more people are spending with few goods in circulation. So to solve this, Congress proposed some bills that will encourage the spender to spend less and save more in hopes that they will lower the current inflation rate. One of these bills is the Inflation Relief Act of 2022. The highlight of this bill is that it reduces the ACA healthcare premium for millions of Americans until 2025. Corporations with at least $1 billion in income will have a new tax rate of 15%. However, families making $400,000 or less will not have any increase in their taxes. Another one is the Middle Class Savings and Investment Act. This tax provides middle class earners tax incentives for saving and investing. This was essentially created to encourage middle income earners to spend less and save more. And the highlight of the proposal is that first, the capital bracket for the 0% rate will be raised from $41,675 and $89,075 and for single and joint filers respectively to $83,350 and $178,150. As a result, if you're a single filer, you will not have to pay capital gains tax on gains up to $83,350. Under the current tax regulations, this amount is taxed at 15%. So if the proposal is approved, you will save $12,502.50 on long-term capital gains tax on gains of $83,350. This will encourage more investment to invest long term and put more money into their investments. Second, it raises the threshold for net investment income tax for married from $250,000 to a whopping $400,000. Third, exclusion from gross income of interest income up to $300 for single filers and $600 for married. Fourth, the enhancement of the savers credit. You can claim this credit or tax deduction for your retirement plans like the 401k or simple IRA or SCP IRA. The current regulation state that depending on your adjusted gross income, you can claim up to 50%, 20%, or 10% of the first $2,000 of your contribution during the year. However, under this proposal, this would increase to $2,500 for singles and heads of households, while it will be $5,000 for married joint filers. Lastly, this proposal would extend the state and local taxes, also known as SALT, cap of $10,000 until 2028. And under the current regulations, this is expected to expire in 2025. And for those who are not familiar with the SALT cap, it provides a tax deduction for those earning $400,000 or below for any payment made to the state or local taxes up to $10,000. For instance, taxes eligible for SALT deduction are income taxes, sales taxes, personal property taxes, and some real property taxes. However, this part of the proposal benefits the higher income earner more than the lower income earner. According to the latest data, GDP has decreased by 0.06% in the second quarter of 2022, following a 1.6% decrease in the first quarter. And if you look at the most common rule of thumb for recession, this means that we have finally entered a so-called recession. However, last July 2022, the White House wrote an article stating that the rule of thumb is not the official definition, nor the factor used by economists to evaluate the state of the economic cycle. In that particular article, the White House also cited the definition of recession as used by the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is the official recession scorekeeper. They state that the recession is a significant decline in economic activity that is spread across the economy and that lasts for a few months. They also enumerated these economic activities like consumer spending or industrial transfer and etc. and so on. They are just trying to say that we're not yet in a recession. However, if you look at the historical data of what a recession is and how and when they occur, there is an average lag period of 234 days between the occurrence of a recession and its official confirmation. For instance, during the financial crisis of 2008, the announcement was made 366 days later. So most of the time, the official announcement is made when the recession or the worst is basically already over. Is it a political move? You tell me. Now that we're done with all of that, let us talk about how this is going to affect you, the investor. 
According to a study conducted by Russell Investments, there were 30 recessions from 1869 to 2018, and among those, 16 recessions have had positive stock market returns. During these times, there was an average return of 9.8% with an average decline of negative 3% on the GDP. So let's take a look at the S&P 500. While the S&P does not represent the whole market, it serves as a decent benchmark for the overall market because it includes the top 500 biggest publicly traded companies in the United States. And according to historical data, stocks performed worse one year after the recession than they did during the recession. So furthermore, price returns were positive more than 70% of the time in the two years after the recession. The S&P's average decline is about 1.5%, while its median is 3.5%. However, four out of the nine recessions from 1957 to 2009 has an average positive return of 14.16%. In other words, a recession could be a good opportunity to rake in some huge returns. While that is the case, remember too that while historical data could be a meaningful guide, it is no way a tool to predict the future. After all, economic data is based on history while the market is forward looking. But it doesn't mean that you should let your guard down either. After all, there are obvious indications of an economic downturn. And as you know, there's a lot of stuff that has happened that hasn't happened in a long time, like the pandemic. So for instance, let's compare what's happening now with the 1973 recession. There was a high increasing inflation and a delayed response from the Fed and an international crisis. And based on the data from the time, we can expect more pain ahead. As for the proposals made by Congress, while the White House hasn't officially declared a recession, it feels like the government is already prepared to combat them by providing tax credits and indexing income thresholds and contributions to inflation. Indexing means income bracket for taxes will increase with the inflation rate. For instance, in the case of long-term capital gains, its current bracket is $41,675 and $89,075 for 0%. So if the inflation rate is 8.2%, then the bracket will automatically increase to $45,092.35 and $96,379.15. This makes sense. After all, the value of your investment for 10 years wouldn't be the same value it is right now. That is why the government seeks to encourage long-term investment with money that is transferred back into businesses with better economic potential and reduced tax rates. But if you ask me if these proposals will help the rising prices of commodities and the continuous inflation rate increase, I don't think so. In fact, according to some studies, while the Inflation Relief Act of 2022 will somewhat bring relief to lower and middle income earners, it states that it won't won't likely reduce prices though. While the Penn Wharton budget model also expressed low confidence that legislation will impact inflation, the Congressional Budget Office also said that it will have a negligible effect on inflation in 2022 and 2023 by 0.1%. So for now, you can increase your liquidity by saving money as much as you can and cost average your investments, meaning you continue to invest a fixed amount regularly. This is particularly helpful during a recession. And that's all for today's video. I threw a whole lot of content, a whole lot of facts and figures, so you can absorb it all. If you need to, watch it again and comment on below what you think these measures are going to do. Stop and inflation, prevent inflation, help inflation, or increase inflation. I hope you enjoyed this video today and found this content to be valuable. And if you do, please go ahead and give this video a big thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. If you're hungry for more, please watch the next video, how to save money when gas prices increase.